Good to see you guys this morning. Glad to be here. Thank you for watching online this morning. Um, anyway, God bless you. Well, here we are. We're, uh, I think, hopefully in our final lesson here on seeing Jesus in the Revelation. I'm excited about getting into that and, and bringing this series uh, to a close. It's been a very, uh, got a lot of positive feedback from this series. And I'm looking forward to our new series that we'll be starting next week, hopefully, uh, which is entitled the beauty of his holiness. And so I'll talk more about that next week. Anyway, uh, just a reminder before we get into things this morning that we have Bible study tonight at 6 o'clock. It's a growing Bible study. Anyone is welcome to come. We're studying A Better Way to Pray uh, by Andrew Womack. And then, uh, uh, just, uh, just throw a filler out there. Uh, starting July 20th, a Saturday, uh, we're going to be starting a new Bible, a series of Bible studies and on um, every Saturday in Pasadena. So that's uh, starting July 20th, every Saturday at 7.30 p.m. in Pasadena. If you want more information about that or any of our Bible studies or services, just go to our website at lighthousediscipleship.org. Uh, you'll see our calendar, our events. You'll see uh, all of our contact information if you need to reach out to us. Anyway, and we are, uh, as a reminder, taking a recess on our LEO Discipleship Program till September, and we'll resume all of that on September 4th, and you'll see all that on our website as well. All right, well, God bless you. Good to see you. Nice warm day here in California, and uh, if warm is your type, it's not ours, uh, but anyway, i just trying to be positive. Anyway, so anyway, here we go. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump in our Bibles this morning to the Book of Revelation, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and start Revelation 1-1 one, one again this morning as we uh, continue our series this morning. All right. Let me just see if my uh, iPad is going to work for us. And here we go. All right, so Revelation 1-1, one, one, it says, The Revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hears the words of this prophecy and keeps those things which are written in it for the time is near. There's a lot here that we've talked about, some that we haven't, uh, but anyway, this is, a, again, as I've been saying every, uh, to every message so far in this series, that this is a book about revealing Jesus Christ. That is the, the book. That is the message in this book. <clears throat> in other words, it's not a revelation about doom and gloom. It's not a revelation about destruction and death. <clears throat> it's not a... Uh, a revelation on all the, the seals, the trumpets, and the, the woes that we're going to look at this morning. It's not a revelation book on the revelation of the wrath and anger of God. It's not a book on the revelation of the Antichrist or the tribulation. It's not a revelation of, or it's not a book of hidden meanings. The book revelation means to open up, to, to open up clearly, to, to unveil, to show openly to make it plain and easy to understand. It's a revelation about a person, and his name is Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, and our King. Many people miss the point when they read this book, especially the thing that we're going to get into this morning. And it's been all the time the last five lessons to, as prerequisite to what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, because I want us to see Jesus in the Revelation. And as, even as we go into, uh, look, uh, look at the remainder of this book today, I want us to see Jesus and the Revelation of Jesus. That makes sense? Okay, that's key. That's why the, it's, I titled it this way. That's why I'm teaching it this way. Uh, I've refrained from teaching on this book before <clears throat> in the past. But I want us to see Jesus. And also in light of the things that were that are the days that we're living in today. Okay? Now, just a small recap. We spent a lot of time, we spent three three hours on talking about what 
Uh, actually, let's uh, let's go down real quick there for Revelation 119 real quick. Excuse me, don't get dizzy on me as I scroll down here on the iPad. In verse 19, Jesus told John to write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. We spent, in other words, we've used this as kind of our table of convicts, our um, roadmap to understanding the outline of this book. John was supposed to write the things, that he, the things that he saw. What did John see? John saw Jesus. And there's many aspects of Jesus that John saw. And we highlighted five of those from chapter one. And the first one we, we highlighted is that Jesus is the living word. Jesus wants us to have a relationship with him, the living word. And in having a relationship with him, the living word, we will have a relationship with the written word. But it's very important any day and also the times when we go through tribulation, and also with the things that are coming ahead on the earth, we need to have a relationship with Jesus, the living word. We focus on, on Jesus being the grace of God. We focus on Jesus being the Savior of the world. We focus on Jesus being the eternal God. The eternal God has offered us eternal life. And we have focused on, and we are continuing to focus on, that Jesus is the resurrected King of eternity. Then we spent uh, two weeks of talking about the things that which are, the things which are in Asia. Jesus wrote seven messages to seven churches that were literally in Asia. Today it would be known in, uh, in the area of Turkey. But in Asia, he wrote seven messages. And I believe that these are messages to seven literal churches in Asia, but also that there are uh, messages to set the seven conditions that can be found in any church. I don't know about you, but I've seen churches that have lost their first love. I've seen churches that have been persecuted. I've seen churches who have become uh, uh, cor uh, uh, corrupt and compromising. I've seen churches that have been dead. I've seen churches that have been very faithful and, and missionary type churches. I've seen uh, churches that have also been in the worst condition like the Lady of Lucia, a church uh, that has uh, uh, become lukewarm. But in every church, God has never left his church. Jesus has a message for his church. And Jesus has a message for his church today. Jesus offers a promise, offers grace, offers a relationship with every church, even the church in its worst condition. And we've taken two weeks to look at those uh, seven letters in chapters 2 and 3. So in, in essence, we've looked at how Jesus is our Savior, and we've looked at how Jesus is our Lord. Now we're going to spend the, the rest of our time here today, and we spend more time on the, on the latter than we will this time, but we're going to be looking at the day that Jesus is not just our Savior and our Lord, but He is our King. Amen? He is our King. So we're going to look more specifically at this last part uh, that we see here in Revelation 119, the things which will take place after this. With that being said, go ahead and turn with me to Revelation chapter 4. We are bored with, bored with everything. I spent so much time on purpose on the first on the first three chapters. More time on chapter one than chapters two and three. In prerequisite as a foundation to what we're going to be looking at in chapters here four four through twenty two. Okay, so we spent three weeks on chapter one. We spent two weeks on chapter two and three, and we're going to spend one week on chapters four through twenty two. Okay. I know that, that might not make logical sense to you, uh, but I, I spent more time on the beginning than the end on purpose. But that being said, J John is a right on the things that will take place after this. So after he writes about the message to the, the seven churches, immediately in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door, standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet, speaking with me, saying, Come up here. And I will show you things which will take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper, and a sardis stone, in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, 
And on the throne I saw twenty-four elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, and thunderings, and voices. And seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. i got to pause there for a moment. But what we're seeing here in chapter 4 is, first of all, John, first of all, gets a direction from, uh, from, from God, saying, come up here, and I will show you the things which will take place after this. Okay? <clears throat> and we see, one, one thing we see here is that John gets caught up, and he, get, he gets to see the throne room of God. I don't know about you, he's the only one that I know of that has seen the throne room of God to this point. Okay? But it's the, it's the, he gone into the Holy of Holies. He's gone into the presence, into the very throne room of God. And now I just want to make a, one mention here, since I read in verse 5, we see that he sees the seven spirits of God. We saw this in chapter 1, we saw so he this again in chapter 2. We're going to see it, we see it here, and then we're going to see it one more time in uh, uh, chapter 5. I mentioned weeks before, I'm not going to go into it, but in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, you can see that I, uh, God, through Isaiah, uh, how should I say it, he begins to show you the seven aspects of God's spirit. Seven aspects of the spirit of God. Okay, that's referred to right here. Okay? I'm not going to go into that. That's not the script for our study. But here we are, and John sees the throne room of God. Okay? He sees his throne. And he's going to hear the things that shall take place after this. Chapter 5, fast forward to be the chapter 5. But in, So we see John sees a revelation of the throne room of God. He sees the one sitting on the throne, which is God. And then he sees in, in chapter 5, he sees in God's right hand a scroll. Some translations interpret that as a book. He sees a, a scroll. And when John sees this scroll, it says in uh, Revelation chapter 5 that John began to weep bitterly with a godly sorrow. Okay? John knew that something, something important was locked up in this book, and it was locked up with seven seals that no one could read it. And so John began to weep bitterly with a godly sorrow. John believed that every believer needed to know what was in this book, but there was no one available, there was no one worthy to open the scroll in the seven seals. So John is in the throne room of God, chapter 4. Chapter 5, he sees the scroll, and no one is fit, no one is worthy to open the scroll, and John is weeping bitterly. I want to pick it up, with that I want to pick it up in Revelation chapter 5. And we'll pick up verse 7. Then, okay, well, actually, we'll pick up verse 5. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seal, seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Verse 7. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and the golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us by God by your blood, out of a tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Because I believe this begins to show from heaven's perspective what Jesus accomplished from one aspect, what Jesus accomplished through the finish with the cross. 
John is in the throne room of God. He sees the scroll. No one is fit or worthy to open the scroll. And it's seven seals, so he's weeping bitterly. And then one of the elders comes to tell him, Stop weeping. And behold, standing in the midst of the throne was the worthy Lamb of God who was slain. He takes the scroll from God's right hand, and he, and he takes that scroll. The, heaven, the, 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 the 24 elders begin to sing a new song that we have been redeemed by his blood, and he has made us to be kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. That is awesome. We looked real briefly in chapter 1 that we are a kingdom of priesthood. We are a royal priesthood, as Peter says. I'm not going to go into all that right now because we don't have time for that. But we are a royal priesthood. Jesus is our king. And what we're, we're going to focus on this morning, that Jesus is our king, and he is the one that is worthy to take the scroll. G John is here in the throne room of God. He sees the Lion of Judah. He sees the Lamb of God. He sees the eternal God who has prevailed to take the scroll and to open its seven seals. Okay, you with me so far? So we're in the throne room of God. There's a scroll in God's right hand. The Lamb, Jesus, is worthy to take the scroll. He takes the scroll from God's right hand, and he begins to open it. He begins to open the seven seals. You got with me so far? I'm missing out a lot of detail, but I'm giving you the, 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 the main scene here, hopefully. And then, in chapters 6 and following, we see that Jesus, as he opens the seven seals one by one, Things begin to happen. Things begin to happen on the earth. But I want to mention something, and that's why I spent so much time, the last five lessons, to get to this point. Everything I said is good for any day, a good day, and even the tribulations we face today. But, because, but the, as the things begin to happen, as the seals begin to open, I spent so much time about how we need to have a relationship with Jesus, our Savior, and our Lord. The, the shepherd of our life, the shepherd of his church, the Lord of his church, and so that we do, no matter what happens in the days of heads, as the seals are open, that we keep our eyes on Jesus. We have a relationship with Jesus, the living word. We have a relationship with Jesus, the grace of God. We have a relationship with Jesus, the, the Savior of the world. We have a relationship with Jesus, the eternal God. Because if you have the Son, you have life. If you have not the Son, you have not life. Eternal life is not heaven. Eternal life is a relationship with God. And no matter what happens on the earth, we need to have a relationship with Jesus. And we don't need to get focused so much on all the things that are happening on the earth. We need to focus on Jesus. Amen? Yeah, that's my main point. That's my main point in this message. No matter what is happening, no matter what condition the church is in, as we talked about in the last few weeks, and also in the days that are coming, the things that will take place after this, we need to have a relationship with Jesus, and we need to see Jesus. John, Jesus said in Luke 21, 26, that many's hearts will fail them, seeing the things that are coming on the earth. That's why we need to focus on Jesus, not the storm, not the things happening on the earth. We're focused on Jesus. That makes sense? That's, ma that's a major point. And that's why I, 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 one of the reasons why I have shied away from speaking from this book, because people want to get so focused on all the things happening on the earth. Yes, they will happen. Jesus prophesied it. John prophesied it. Paul prophesied it. Peter speaks of things. But we need to keep our focus on Jesus. That is crucial. That is important. In other words, don't get your eyes on all the death and destruction. Don't get your eyes on all the challenges. Don't get your eyes on the Antichrist, or the false prophet, or the beast, or the devil. Don't get your focus on a false economic system. Don't get your focus on the false religious system. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Now, as these seven seals, I'm not going to go into specifics about these seven seals, but I will list them for you shortly right now. Okay? As these seven seals uh, began to open in chapter 6 and following, we see the first seal is the white horse, and it's the Antichrist. The second seal is the red horse, and it's war. The third seal is the black horse, and it's famine. 
The fourth, horse, fourth seal is the pale horse and his death. The fifth seal is the soul of martyrs. The sixth seal is a great earthquake. And then the seventh seal consists of seven trumpets are also seven vials or bowls. And both the seven vials and the seven trumpets, as you read the book of Revelation, they correspond with each other. So we have seven seals, but under the seventh seal, there's seven trumpets or vials. And these seven trumpets are as such. The first one, as the first trumpet sounds, things begin to happen on the earth. The second trumpet sounds, things begin to happen on the sea. The third trumpet sounds, and things happen on the fresh water. The fourth trumpet sounds, and things happen on the sun, with the sun and the moon and the stars. And then the fifth trumpet sounds is the first woe. The second sound, the, 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 sec, the sixth trumpet is the st- second woe, and there's a plague on the earth. And then the seventh trumpet, which is the third woe, which is the seventh of uh, the seventh seal, Jesus comes again as our king. I know that's, I'm not going to go into all that detail. But while all this is happening, among these seven vials or bowls, among these seven trumpets, and among these seven seals, go with me real quick to Revelation 16. Revelation 16, verse 15. So while all this is happening, with the seven seals... And the seventh, and the, the seventh trumpet, or the seventh vial of the seventh seal. While all this is happening, all these seals, all these trumpets are going on, and all these vials are happening. Verse chapter sixteen, verse fifteen. This verse is like just thrown out in the middle of all this. And I was listening to Lawson Purdue as he was teaching this, and so I'm just going to use his point with this. Okay, because I feel like in, with this he has a, a better revelation than I do on this. But I lost in his point out, in the midst of all this is going on, this verse just comes out, seems like it comes from the middle of nowhere. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments as he walk and naked, and they see his shame. No, and, and so Lawson asks this question, so what's Jesus saying here? What's he saying here? I job, and I'll just quote Lawson. Jesus is saying, keep your eyes on me. While all this is going on, all these vials and trumpets and all these seals are happening and all these things are happening in the earth and all the things that happening with the Antichrist, the war and, and whatnot and all the destruction is taking place. Keep your eyes on me. Everyone will be tempted to get their eyes on everything that's happening. It's already happening in our world today. Look at Facebook. Look at the news. Things are, everyone's focused on everything that's happening. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be involved to a certain point. I'm not saying that one I own. We need to be involved in the right way, in the right time, in the right manner, with the right voice, doing the right thing. But in the midst of even of our involvement, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus and not get caught up in all the drama of everything going on. Am I, my folks? Don't focus on the seals and the horses. Don't focus on the Antichrist, the war, and the dragon. Don't focus on the, the false economic system and the false religious systems. As your pastor, as your brother in Christ, I my charge to you is to keep eyes on Jesus, to keep your focus and your energy on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, your Savior, your Lord, your King. Don't, again, don't get your focus on the death and the construction, this destruction. Don't get focused on the challenges and the Antichrist and the beast and the dragon. Don't get focused on the false prophet and the devil. Don't get focused on the, the false economic and the false religious systems. Keep focus on Jesus. We know these things will happen. John prophesied. Jesus prophesied. P- Paul prophesies it. Uh, Peter speaks of this. Yes. But keep your eyes on Jesus. 
keep the main thing. The main thing. And it's the revelation of Jesus. But while all this is going on, it's, I believe it's also important that we understand what Jesus is really doing. What, Je- what is going on. Jesus is getting ready to take over the earth. Jesus will reign, and we'll get to this in a minute, will reign on the earth for a thousand years of peace. And he said that we, the church, will reign. That is awesome. Our king is coming again. Jesus is removing things that would hinder the process of establishing his peace on the earth. Jesus, it says in Isaiah, is our prince of peace. It says in Hebrews 7 2, he is our king of righteousness and he is our king of peace. And while all this is happening, keep your focus on Jesus. He's the one you're looking for. Don't lose sight of the goal. Don't lose sight of the promise. Don't lose sight of the answer. Don't lose sight of Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen? Amen? That is my main point so far in this message. Now, show with me real quickly to Revelation chapter 11. We're going to switch gears a little bit here. Okay? Verse 15. Revelation 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded the seventh trumpet, so that's the last trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, Almighty, the one who is and who was, and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. There's more I could read here, but I'm just trying to give you. So, what's happening here? We have the seventh trumpet of the seventh seal. And as the seventh trumpet of the seventh seal, we hear the voice from heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Everything that's happened has happened to come to this point where Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords reigns on the earth. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 when the last trumpet sounds, I'm paraphrasing, but he says that he must reign, he must put all things underneath his feet and the last enemy that he'll put under his feet is death. Okay? But I want to focus on real quickly here that when the seventh the seventh trumpet or the seventh vial, when the seventh trumpet sounds of the seventh seal, the book is finally open. This book, the scroll that Jesus retrieved from the his father's right hand, that John saw back in Revelation 4 and 5, the book is finally open. It begins at the last trumpet sounds and the, and the last seal is open. And when that happens, Jesus comes to reign on the earth, and Jesus establishes his kingdom of peace on the earth, and we reign with him for a thousand years. Now, real quickly, fast forward with me real quick here to Revelation chapter 19. With me so far? There's some other detail I'm not going into. I'm not going into on purpose, because that's not the scope of my message. Or even in this series, I'm focused on revealing Jesus, seeing Jesus in the Revelation. Okay? Revelation 19, begin with verse 11. It says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Verse 14, And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, and white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now again, I'm not going to go into every detail here. The one thing I want to point out, if you notice back when I talked about the the seven seals, the first horse is a white horse, and it's the Antichrist. Here we have Jesus coming, and he's also coming on a white horse. 
both the Antichrist and Jesus comes on a white horse. The Antichrist is mimic, will mimic the true Christ. Okay? That's one of the reasons why he's called the Antichrist. Uh, 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 there's more to that than that. But how do you know he's not the true Christ? How do you know that the Antichrist is not the true Christ? Because the, the fruit follows his entry. When you see the Antichrist, what follows his entry? War, famine, death, destruction. Now it says here in verse 11 that when Jesus comes, the faithful and true, that in righteousness he judges and makes war. There's war coming. But in righteousness he judges and makes war. Now we're not going to go into it, but if you read the book of Jude, the book of Daniel, chapter 7, in Zechariah chapter 14, that Jude specifically uh, mentions that Enoch prophesied that there would be that Jesus would come with ten thousands of angels. I mean, ten thousands. Uh, uh, excuse me, I said that wrong. He would, he's coming with ten thousand saints. But let me just m mention this: Jesus is not just coming for his church. Jesus is also coming with his church. And let me just mention this. I want, I want, I want, there's a lot of things in here and not everything I understand completely. But I do understand this. That we, as a church of Jesus Christ, we are looking forward to the return of our King and our Lord and our Savior of Jesus Christ. We are looking forward to it with great hope and great anticipation. Hail our King Jesus. You know, growing up in our church, and I just want to mention that, we had a song that we sung. And it went something like this. All hail King Jesus. All hail Emmanuel. King of kings. Lord of lords. Bright morning. And throughout eternity, I'm going to praise Him. And forevermore, I will reign with Him. Amen? He is our King. We will reign with Him. And we are looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ. We call it our blessed hope. We call it the glorious appearing of our great God and Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul talks about this in length in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. But our blessed hope is that Jesus is going to live forever. He is going to reign forever. And we will reign with him. When he comes, though, he's going to come in righteousness. He will judge and he will make war. Okay, he, Paul even talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, that we will judge. We will, we, we, uh, um, there will be judgment that will come. And he, Paul talks about this in, also in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Go, continue with me, though. In Revelation 19.15, and, and John writes, Now out of his mouth, Jesus, goes a sharp sword, and that, it, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron, and he himself treads the winepress of, of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, I may not understand every single detail here, but I know my king is coming back. And he is the King of Kings, and he is the Lord of Lords, and when he makes war and judges, he will do it with righteousness. Amen? And uh, he is our king, and he is coming back. We've been studying throughout this book so far that Jesus is our Savior. He is the Lord of his church. He wants a relationship with us. And he is our king. He is Lord of his church. He is Savior of his, he saved his church. He washed us, and when he washes and saved us, he laid down his life for his church. He, he is our Lord and our King. And He's returning with for His church. And He's returning with His church. Okay? 
and we will reign with him. Now, the Antichrist, if we will continue to read the scriptures, the Antichrist will lead many nations away from Christ. The Antichrist will come against Israel. I believe both natural and even spiritual Israel. We read about some of this in Zechariah 14. But in Zechariah 14 it says, Jesus will set his feet on Mount of Olives, go across the valley, go to the eastern gate, and set up his kingdom on the earth. And he will reign for a thousand years, peace on earth, and we will reign with him. It's a marvelous, marvelous marvelous thing. I can't say I understand every single detail. I'm not focused on the detail. I'm focused what? On Jesus. That makes sense? i got to focus on Jesus. Because I, I, no matter how it plays out, I know the end of the story. Jesus reigns. And we reign with him. And whether we die physically, we will reign with him forever. That makes sense? Jesus is my king. This is not a book about doom and gloom. This is a book about grace. And this is a book about my Savior and my Lord and my King, Jesus Christ. Hail King Jesus. He has made, redeemed us by his blood. And he has made us to be kings and priests to reign on the earth. We are not kings and priests and out of the order of Levi, the Levitical law, we are king to priest out of the order of a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, who lives and reigns forever. It's a kingdom of grace, not a kingdom of law. Okay, I'm not going in there to teach you about that right now. Go with me uh, back to Revelation chapter 19, though. I want to switch gears one more time. And we're going to backtrack just a little bit. We're going to go towards the beginning of the chapter. Verse 6. That's right. One, one more time. Revelation 19, verse 6. And I heard, and as it were, the voice of a great multitude and the sound of... A great, sorry, let me read that again. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunderings saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God, omnipotent, all-powerful, reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and, and, one, and of your brother, who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Man, that's a whole message right there. Just in itself. The, 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 for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's the whole message. The, any prophecy you hear, it's not a testify of Jesus. It's not the spirit of prophecy. Anyway, that's a whole other message right there. I'm not going to go there right now. Uh, keep that thought in mind. Everything we just read about uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb. But scroll with me real quick to Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God and who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now there's a couple things I want need to bring out here. And we're going to read a little bit more in just a minute. And I, some people will get confused with some of this. We have to understand there's two resurrections. There's two judgments. There's two deaths. Let me get with the two deaths first. And brief. Two deaths. If you're born twice, meaning you're born again, you die once. If you're 
born once, meaning you're not born again. You die twice. It's called the second death. And we'll look at the second death in just a moment. But there's two resurrections. There's a resurrection of the just, and there's a resurrection of the unjust. And we'll look at that in more detail in just a second. There's a thousand-year reign of Christ that separates the first resurrection of the just from the resurrection of the unjust. There's a thousand-year reign that separates the two. In the Revelation 19, the first passage that we just read, Jesus is coming for and with his church. The church will be resurrected up. And I believe this is called the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is a judgment of saints, of believers. The judgment seat of Christ, they're judged for what they did with Jesus. In other words, it's a reward seat with Jesus. And they get to come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But in Revelation chapter 20, and, and, and that's called, what we just read also in Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6, that this is the first resurrection. But read with me also Revelation 20, beginning with verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from those from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for me. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in their books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and the death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So that we saw that uh, there was a, there was a, the, the, the resurrection of the, uh, the, the just, who are justified, declared righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. A reward seat and the judgment seat of Christ. And they get to go to the marriage of the Lamb. There was a thousand year reign of Christ in between that judgment and this judgment, what we call the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment, in comparison with the judgment seat of Christ, is a judgment of unbelievers. This is where people are judged from their works apart from Christ. Why? Because they rejected Christ. They didn't receive Christ. And their names are not lit, written in the Lamb's Book of Life because their names were blotted out. Jesus died for the whole world. We've talked about that in, in John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, 2 verse 2. And also 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse, verses 17, uh, verses 18 to 19. Jesus has died for the whole world. He is not imputing their sins to them. But if they reject Christ, if they reject the propitiation, they will be judged for their works apart from Christ. And they will be cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That why, that's why I said if you're born once, if you're not born again, you do die twice. If you're born, you know, Born twice, you won't experience the second death. It says here what we just read that they won't have anything to do with. In other words, the second death cannot affect those who are born again. It can affect those who are judged in Christ. We are just in Christ. Um, hopefully, I'm making sense. So let me just reiterate: There's a, the first resurrection is the resurrection of the unjust. I mean, excuse me, I said that wrong. The, 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 the first resurrection is the resurrection of the just. Those who believe on Jesus, and they all go to the judgment seat of Christ, and they're judged for what they've done with Jesus. In other words, it's a reward seat, and the reward is life, eternal life. Not just spiritually. I mean, you know, true eternal life is a relationship with Jesus, but we will also live with him physically, face to face, forever and within eternity. The second resurrection is the resurrection of the unjust. And those are. Um, and this is after the thousand years, and those who do not believe on Jesus all go to the great white throne judgment, judged on their works apart from Jesus, and they are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. God wants none to go there. But we all know that many people have not believed and have refused to receive, receive and they have even rejected Jesus. The 
thousand year reign of Christ and his church comes between the resurrection of the just and the unjust. Now, real quickly, I want to use this to support everything I just said. Go with me to John chapter 5. We'll pick it up in verse 24. Jesus is speaking. And we're going to see the two resurrections here, too. He says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has that everlasting life. It shall not come unto judgment, but has passed from death, and death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, and this is key, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has lived life in himself, so he has granted the Son to live in himself. He's speaking here of a spiritual resurrection. He's speaking here of being born again. Okay? And he has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. But verse 28. Do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming. It hasn't come. He doesn't add on the words, it now is. But the hour is coming, future sense, in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth those who, verse 29 is key, and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and to those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation, two resurrections. Those who are in Christ, because if there's any good in us, it's because of Jesus, our Savior. They have the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of my Father who sent me. And Jesus speaking. I'm not, again, I'm not going to go into all this detail. And I don't want to spend so much time, but it basically, the, 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 if we have received Jesus, we come to the judgment seat of Christ, and we are rewarded a marriage supper of the Lamb and life eternal with Jesus. If we have not received Jesus, we come to the great white throne, our lamp and our names, whoever goes to that, their names are not written in the book of life, and then we'll go into the second death, hell, whatever. Um. I just want to fast forward some things. Revelation 21 says, if you, if you read it, I don't have time to read it all right now. After Jesus is with his church for reigning for a thousand years, we are going to receive a new heaven and a new earth. Why are we going to receive a new heaven and a new earth? Because sin has messed up this one so bad. It's beyond repair. To it's perfection. And to and there's no way to to get it back to where it should be. Peter talked about this, and I'll just make reference to this real quick. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look forward to a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's awesome. I don't have time to teach you all that right now, but righteousness dwells there. We're going to see this in this moment, that there will be no sin in heaven. There will, be, there will be nothing but righteousness. As we continue to read, I don't have time to read it all right now, but in Revelation chapter 21, we're going to see that heaven, paradise, the new Jerusalem, is a beautiful, beautiful, marvelous place. We're going to see, you can read it for yourself, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, there will be no more death there. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. Because the former things have passed away. But can I say this? The best thing about heaven is Jesus is there. And we're going to see him face to face. We will live in the, the presence of our Savior. The presence of our Lord. And the presence of our King. Forever. You know the worst thing about hell? Is Jesus is not there. That's the worst thing about hell. There is no Jesus. You know, even the ungodly in this world, nobody really knows what it's like 
to be totally void of the presence of God. The grace of God has affected this world and this earth. No one truly knows, because even the heavens declare of God's handiwork. Nobody in this life understands what it means to be totally void of the presence of God. But hell will be totally void of the presence of God. And the only people who will be there are the ungodly. That's the worst thing about hell besides the torment. That would be torment or not. Okay. But uh, let me just read this real quick. Uh, Revelation 21-27. We're, start, start, we're, heading, we're rounding their base. We're heading home. Okay. So Revelation 21-27 says, But there will by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The only believers will be there. No one, no sin will be there. Now we come to Revelation 22. I love this. Verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of the street, in a, on either side of the river, was a tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Verse 3, I love this. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. There will be no more curse. This is complete redemption. Full circle. We've talked about this earlier, but the Bible begins in paradise at the, in Genesis chapter 2. It begins in paradise at the tree, at the river of God, at the tree of life. And it ends in Revelation chapter, the Bible ends in Revelation chapter 22, at the paradise of God, at the throne of God, at the river of God, and the tree of life. It's redemption in full circle. We read this earlier in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. I a little ahead of myself in my notes. But he who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. Paradise. You know, we, you know, we've talked already how paradise is and, and real eternal life is a relationship with Jesus. That's why the, ba the best thing about heaven is Jesus will be there. But there is a tree of life. There is a river of God. It's for the, and the, the tree of life that leaves are for the healing of the nations. Let me just make this mention though. In Galatians 3.13, and we talked about this many times in the past, but where it says that Christ has redeemed us from the, the curse of the law. You know, when Adam sinned in Genesis chapter 3, man was cursed, the woman was cursed, the serpent was cursed, and the earth was also cursed. Christ has redeemed us, mankind, from the curse of the law. But the earth is still affected by the curse. It's still affected. But we're going to receive a new heaven and a new earth. There will be no more curse. Not only on us, but in the earth as well. You know, we have never, in our lifetime, we have never experienced that non-curse on earth. Because it's been cursed since Adam. But some people ask why bad things happen to good people. Because the earth is still affected by sin. And it's still affected by Satan. But in all of this book of Revelation, some things that we didn't go into detail, Satan will be no more. There will be no more curse. All there will be is Jesus and those who have received. We are coming full circle. We are coming to the throne of God, river of God, the tree of God, the life. There is no more curse, and Jesus is coming again. Think of Revelation 22, verse 4. 
and they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads, and they shall be there shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord our God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Look at verse 7. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I felt, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And then he said to me, See that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of this do not seal the words of this of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And he who is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he is filthy, let him be filthy still, he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He is holy, and he be holy still. What does he mean by that, verse 11? The state that you die in is the state that you will spend eternity. How many know the only way we become righteous is receiving Jesus? The only way we become holy is receiving Jesus. And without Jesus, we are filthy. We are unjust. But in whatever state that you die in is the state that you will spend eternity in. And we have received Jesus, and we are holy, and we are made righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we will be righteous and holy still. It's awesome. But let's just see this, verse 12, 12, 12 and following. And behold, I am coming quickly, Jesus says, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and scorchers and sexual even moral, murderers and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. You know, this is the third time John has said this. He says this in Revelation 21, verse 8. He said this in Revelation 21, verse 7. And he says it here again in Revelation chapter 22, verse 15. I believe John is making a point to a clear separation between what heaven and hell is like. These people will not be there. And I believe John's saying, I want you to have, uh, actually Jesus is saying this here, he's quoting Jesus. I want you to have a clear picture of the difference between heaven and hell. See, all of our lives, even if we have not been, been involved with these things, we have experienced these things in our world. Just the media, the stores, I mean, the, the checkout stands at the grocery store, you can see it through the magazines, whatnot. But there's a difference between heaven and hell, hell and, and there's a difference in we, these things will not, because it says outside our dogs, outside of heaven. They're not going to be in there. They're not, we're not going to experience them. They're not there no more. That makes sense? It's a beautiful, marvelous place. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. In the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires to let him take the water freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of these books. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the place that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the, of, of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the, the things which are written in this book. And he who testifies to these things says, Surely I am surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. I believe one thing Jesus is saying, verse 20 here, Jesus is saying, he's speaking to this church and he's saying, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, keep believing, keep believing. Verse 21, I love this, this closure to the book of Revelation. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You know, this is a book of grace. It's a revelation of grace. We have seen what John saw, that Jesus is our Savior. He is our Lord. And He is our King. He is the Savior of the world. He is the Lord of this church. And he is our coming king. 
we have seen that Jesus is the grace of God. And Jesus offers grace to his church, to every church, even the church in its worst condition. And he concludes this whole book by saying, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So be it. So be his grace to be on your life. This is a book about Jesus. This is a book about grace. This is, Jesus is our promise. Jesus is our answer. And Jesus is our everything. And Jesus has a message for his church. And that is to reveal to you Jesus, the living word, the grace of God, the Savior of the world, the eternal God, uh, the, the, our resurrected King of eternity. A lot will take place in these last days, but we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. I'm not reading a lot of these things that will take place because I don't want that to be the focus. I don't want that to be magnified. I want Jesus to be magnified. I want to see what things will take place. We don't need to know, know all the things in detail, I don't believe. I believe we need to focus on Jesus and let our attention be on Jesus because otherwise our hearts will fail us for fear that will come on the earth. We need to have a relationship with Jesus. We need to know these things in the, in the sense of that they don't totally catch us by surprise. We know these things are going to happen. We know of them, but we need to know Jesus. Okay? Jesus will reign as king. And we, as the church of Jesus Christ, we will reign with him. I don't care what it looks like in the world. I don't care what the world says and even tries to do with the church. We will reign with Jesus Forever and ever and ever. Jesus, the, the, the earth is the Lord's and it's filled with his glory. Jesus is going to do some cleaning up. And everything that can be shaken will be shaken, but that which cannot be shaken will remain. And that is our faith in Jesus Christ, our King. And Jesus is our resurrected King of eternity. Jesus is the Lord of his church and he is our coming king and as John said even so come Lord Jesus our king amen did you get anything out of this I hope it was good I know I didn't go into some of the details that some people were probably hoping I would go into but that was on purpose that's not my focus that's not my message my next message is to see Jesus in the revelation other people can talk about that other stuff, and that's fine with you, fine with them. But I want us as a pastor to see Jesus in the revelation. That is my heart. That's my focus. That's my forte on this book, this marvelous book that reveals my Savior, my Lord, and my King. And I, I, I don't really care how it happens. I even know the end of the book. I am with Jesus as my King. We wear the victor's crown. It's ours. And it's going to get ugly in the earth. But that's not the focus. It's not a book about just being focused. It's not a book about gloom and doom. It's a book about Jesus. It's about the grace of God. And you know how many, you know, no matter where you are, even in a good condition, you can go to any church, you can go to any situation, and you can look for what's wrong and focus on that. Or you can look for what's good and focus on that. No matter what happens, if you have a relationship with Jesus, He is your Prince of Peace. He is your King of Glory. And only those who have learned to have a relationship with Jesus, those who have a relationship with Jesus, are going to be protected from all this chaos. I'm not just talking about the chaos itself, but even in our minds and our hearts from growing in fear. You need a relationship with Jesus. Look at Daniel. Look at the three Hebrew children. Look at Joseph. Look at people like David. Look at people like Noah, who were being laughed at for building an ark. Look at the apostles, all martyred. And even John himself, boiled in oil and thrown on the island of Patmos to shut him up. They all went through things. Jesus was crucified. And so, persecution will be there. And it's not always going to be a bed of roses. But all these people stayed in the game. Because get the main thing, the main thing, and that is Jesus, her Father, her God, Jesus. And that 
It's the only thing that will keep you. And even Stephen, when he's being stoned, he saw Jesus standing on the throne of God. That's awesome. That's beautiful. That's profound. That is our hope of glory. Lord, we worship you. We magnify you. Yes, we say, even come to Lord Jesus, but we know that you delay that more people can come into the kingdom. We thank you for that. And while we're here, tell, teach us and show us how we can be occupied until you come. That we can bring others into the kingdom because you are coming. And the door will close. But we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity you gave us. We thank you that you are coming. We thank you that you are our Savior. We have redeemed us from the pit. You have saved us from not only eternal hell, but you have saved us from the hell that we've once experienced here. We thank you that you are our Lord and that you love us and you open, you, you, you give us, a, offer us a relationship and promise even in our worst conditions that we've been in our life. We thank you, Lord, that you are our King. We thank you that you will keep us in perfect peace. He whose mind is stayed upon you because we trust in you. Lord, that's my message this morning. You are coming, and you are king, and we have our King Jesus. We worship you, we magnify you, as we even did this morning in song. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock, and God bless you. All right. God bless.